Hi, I'm Lance, and uh, for the next few minutes or so, I want to just encourage you. My friends and I have been talking about how folks just don't have time to listen to 20 or 30 minutes or an hour worth of teaching. So we're going to take a really brief amount of time and hopefully encourage you and show you something maybe you haven't seen before. Um, back in the beginning is kind of where it all starts, right? When Adam and Eve fell, the first thing they did is ran and hid in the bushes. Uh, they were afraid of God. The God that loved them one moment, now they're afraid of him. From that moment on, we have been alienated from God in our own minds is what Paul says. We've actually been enemies of God, not him, uh, us as his enemies, but him as our enemies. And we, have not, we haven't seen the face or beheld the face of God. Actually, John says this, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Um, this sounds like a pretty sad story, but uh, there's, some, there's some great news that I want to share with you. First of all, let me share a story I heard from a guy named Brad Jerzak. Um, Brad talks about his son who was dating a girl, and uh, they had recently broken up, and the girl was having some pretty hard times, and she was, uh, she was struggling with some depression. And uh, his son, Brad's son, was praying about this girl, and he felt like God said, you know, you should give her a nice day. So he asked the girl to come over to the house and meet him, and he would take her out and uh, show her a nice time that, that particular day. Now, what you need to know about this girl is not only was she wrestling with depression and, and a lot of sadness in her life, but she didn't know God. She wasn't a believer. She didn't acknowledge Jesus or any of those sorts of things. So she had no relationship with God that, that at least we know of. So when she comes over to the house, Brad has just a short amount of time, about four minutes, he says, with this girl. And uh, he wanted to encourage her uh, through uh, a time of listening prayer. Now, as a non-believer, she doesn't know anything about prayer or how to converse with God. So he asked her, would you like to do a thinking experiment or would you like to uh, do a thinking game? And she says, well, of course I would. And he says, all right, let's do this. Let's imagine for a second if you could meet God today, where would that be? Now, here's the funny thing about her response. She says, I see, not if I was thinking about it, this was what it would look like. But she actually says, I see a field with a tree. So she's already being transported in, in her own imagination to a meeting place with God. Now he's asked her, where is God in the picture? And she says, well, he's under the tree. And then he asked her, well, what is his countenance? And she says, wow, he's smiling. He's kind. I had no expectation that he would be this kind and this loving. Um, wow, I'm really amazed. And then he says, okay, well, if you go up to him, what does he say to you? And she says, he says to me, I love you, and I've been waiting for you. Now, needless to say, she was in tears at this point, and she was rocked. <laughs> God had touched this girl in a way that she didn't think was possible. So she had a little conversation with God. She met him in a meeting place, and he touched her, and he changed her life likely uh, forever. I don't know the rest of the story, but I think that should encourage you. <clears throat> Jesus says it this way, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard, his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one who he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Isn't that crazy that we would search the scriptures? You know, Jesus says that to know God is eternal life. Eternal life is knowing the Father through the Son. And Jesus makes it clear that we have an opportunity to know the Father through the Son. He says this, that um, when he sends the Spirit of truth that he's going to confirm in us that... We will know this, this one truth that he reveals to us. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. Jeremiah says it a different way. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Not only do we have the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus Christ, dwelling in us. But Jeremiah has confirmed that it's actually he's speaking to our heart, our minds, his entire nature, his character, his very being. The law of liberty and the law of love is dwelling within us. Later, Jeremiah says this, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things 
that you do not know. Is it possible to have a relationship with someone that you don't have a conversation with? This is the most amazing promise, uh, I guarantee you, that if we call on him, he will answer. It's a covenant promise. Jesus poured out his blood so that we would be certain that it's true. God died so that we would know his promise is real. And so if we call on him, he will answer. I, I think that's absolutely amazing. And didn't that girl see that happen in her own life? Let me just encourage you with, uh, with one last parting shot. There's no condemnation when we talk to him. In 1 John 3, 19 through 22, this is in the Mirror Bible. In this we know that our being is sourced in that which is really true about us. Our doing good is not phony or make-believe. This is who we are in God's sight and in his belief. So even if our own hearts would accuse us of not really being true to ourselves, God is greater than our hearts, and he has the full picture. His knowledge of us is not compromised. Beloved, when we know what God knows to be true about us, then instead of condemning us, our hearts will be endorse, will endorse our innocence and free our conversation before God. Now, instead of begging God, we speak with confident liberty as sons. We also treasure the conclusion of his prophetic purpose in redeeming our sonship and fully accommodate ourselves to his desires and pleasure, knowing the warmth in his eyes inspire poetic freedom in our every expression. Isn't that amazing? I tell you, let's do an experiment. How about you do one with me right now? Let's ask God for a second um, what the meeting place might be like. So in your imagination, if you could meet God right now, what would that place look like? It can be a place that's familiar to you. It's, it can be a place um, that's new. It can be a common place, a kitchen, a bedroom, a field like this young lady. Now in that place, where are you? Where are you? If you're in the kitchen, where are you sitting or standing? If you're in the field, where are you? Put yourself in the picture. And now while you're there in the picture, where is God? Where is God? What does he look like? Does he look like Jesus? Does he look like Abba Father? Does he look like something else? Does he look like a sheep? <laughs> All of that's perfectly legal. So when you walk up to him, what is his countenance towards you? What is his expression? I guarantee it'll be smiles. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now ask him the big question. What do you have for me? He'll give you a, a present. He'll give you uh, a word. He'll show you a picture. But he has something for you. He wants to have a conversation with you. He shed his blood and he died so that you could know the Father. So I would encourage you, whatever you've begun today, that you continue, that you seek after him and know that when you call on him, he will answer.